I believe entrepreneurs are the catalyst for change, like globally on a, on a massive scale. So if there are more entrepreneurs out there who know how to execute and are executing on something like worth their time, then, then absolutely that, that as an end goal makes the, you know, the two hours spent here, like one of the best investments that I can do. Hello, everyone. This is the Parker.com podcast powered by WFO.TV. This is a podcast where we interview Parker pros, Parker coaches, Parker gym owners, and other people deeply involved in the Parker industry. The goal is to bring their insight, their wisdom, and their stories to you. To help you become a better Parker athlete, a better Parker entrepreneur, and to entertain you with great Parker stories. On this episode, I had the privilege of interviewing Jimmy Davidson. Jimmy has been a tracer since 2007, and he was a member of the Tribe, which was one of the United States' premier parkour teams in the 2000s and 2010s. Jimmy is also the founder and owner of Freedom in Motion, a California-based parkour gym with two facilities, and they're opening a third here soon. Here's the deal. Each facility has between three and 400 members, and collectively, they bring in more than a million dollars in revenue per year. If that's not impressive enough, realize this. Jimmy started the gyms remotely, and he lives 400 miles away from the gym. I figured this out in the podcast, and my mind was blown because I started the gym, and I was there every day from sunup to sundown, but he did it remotely. So clearly, he's doing something right, whether or not you have a gym if you want to start one or if your gym's not quite at that seven figure level and you want some help and some insight, this podcast is definitely worth a listen. Please like and subscribe, comment if you feel like it, and maybe even check out our sponsors in the links below. We publish a new podcast episode every week. And if maybe a two hour discussion is in your type of thing, we extract the best clips from every podcast and publish those. Just about every day we put a new clip online. It's two, four, six, eight minutes long, a power punch of a sound bite that'll bring value to your life. So subscribe and stay tuned for those. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Jimmy Davidson. Let's start at the top and then we'll work our way back. You are opening your third gym in California. Yeah, that's right. We are opening uh, a gym in Riverside, which is uh, kind of east of L.A., and it's somewhat near the other two gyms we already have. Okay. And what is the difference between this third gym and the first two gyms? Um, well, the, the design, this is actually going to be the fourth gym that we've built. Um, our very first gym was opened and quickly was forced to shut down. We can talk about that. But as we've gone through the different iterations of the gyms, we've sort of learned multiple things along the way. But one is like, you know, how do you design a gym optimized for the thing that you're actually trying to do there, which is teach classes to your target audience. Um, and our very first gym was like very not optimized for any of that. It was, it was just like a cool playground for me and my friends, you know? So mm. gym number two um, was like a little bit better in that direction. Gym number three was like very much, we intentionally designed it for our target audience. Um, and now this fourth gym is we, we're taking kind of all the lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, we're also, you know, along the way you make those little mistakes or you get different coaches with different ideas in there and they're like, ah, oh, if this vault box is just a little bit different, it could be used for all these different things. Um, so we spent the last, you know, year before we started construction, compiling that, like revising our like coaching zone um, document you know, which has like all the standard things that every coaching zone has to have to make it workable for classes, getting all the best ideas from our coaches. This one guy named Mayan has got like tons of great ideas. Um, and hopefully this time around, um, our lead designer with Freedom Motion, his name is Nick Blake, uh, did a really excellent job, like, you know, designing it all in SketchUp and executing it with the build. And it looks like this one has all of our like best ideas kind of wrap up into one. Um, so as far as what's tangibly different, when you show up, uh, you'll see that those ideas are evolving gym to gym. Um, but behind the scenes, you know, all of the gyms are all kind of on the same platform. Um, you know, we're not a franchise at this time, all the, all the locations are in-house. So um, behind the scenes, they're all kind of operating at that same efficiency right now, which is great. 
this is fascinating. So I want to hear more about the first thing you talked about, which was transitioning a gym from what sounded like more or less a place to train to a business establishment. And I want to tell a brief story and then you can riff on that and tell me your experience. So um, I started the gym Revolution Parkour. I started that company in 2008 and then opened a gym in 2010. And I designed a facility based around optionality and versatility. And what I noticed at the time was every other gym that I saw in the parkour world was built around jamming as many obstacles as possible into the gym. And I didn't feel like it developed a flow. Um, you're the first person I've ever hear talk about designing a gym for classes or for students. And I think that that's actually a paradigm shift and a level up in the way people think about gyms. And I think it's happened probably naturally, but also it wasn't intuitive in the beginning. So that's my perspective on it. But but tell me yours and can you delve into more details about how the first gym wasn't optimized for classes and then now you're thinking with that mindset? Totally. So the first gym, um, a way that I have described it in the past was it was the, oh, where'd you go? <laughs> it was the- Yeah, I'm going to focus on you, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, the first gym was the Taj Mahal of parkour build out you know like it was this giant massive climbable structure of, of wood and plywood and all that um and to us it was it was sick um and you know the kids when they get in there for their first couple of times it's cool to them too it's this giant thing they can climb on it they can jump off the high thing into the foam um but you know as you progress and you go months by months by and you have to pay your bills you just kind of realize like man we can only fit like two classes into this at the time it was a 6,000 square foot facility you know if we got real creative we can squeeze this third class in here but that one class is going to be like obviously the worst area in the gym um and then during open gym you know like we're constantly having to help kids like figure out how to get up onto stuff it wasn't intuitive for them to get from ground level to most of the funner areas in the gym um and we just like didn't anticipate that when we were designing it. Um, I was 19 at the time. So literally we had my mom's cutting board with like a bunch of modeling clay and we were just like making cool stuff and being like, oh yeah, this giant thing's gonna be awesome. But at that time, I absolutely wasn't thinking about who my real target audience was. Uh, not just my desired audience, my like the audience that's actually gonna help me pay the bills and who the person is that I'm actually trying to teach parkour to. Neither of those things were like accurately targeted in my head. Um, so yeah, as we, as we progressed, we learned that you can't just like build giant cool structures. You have to think about how much open space do you have for classes and for the warmups um, so that your modular, you know, equipment can be designed in those open spaces so that you can teach specific things about your curriculum. Um, if you do have larger areas like a foam pit retainer, like how do the littlest kids in your gym interact with that? Um, do they just like show up and constantly ask your coaches for help? Like, are you guys going to help them climb on stuff? Um, all of these, we just totally didn't have in the beginning, but we evolved it over time. Um, and what I mentioned a little bit ago was the, the standards for each coaching zone. Um, this kind of ties into that as well. So once you, once you're a parkour program, a gym specifically, or a teaching program, and you you know your curriculum, ideally you have your, you know, you, you have a client journey, you know what beginners learn, what intermediate students learn. Um, once you have that, you should be able to look at your different coaching zones. Let's say you have three or two coaching zones. Um, if you expect your coaches to be learning or to be teaching wall climbs or laches, like two of the harder things to set up, um, you can't waste 20 minutes of class, like dragging in giant heavy walls or having your coaches like screwing and unscrewing piping, um, like maybe before class, but if you have eight, 10 classes in a row in a day, that's not sustainable. So if you design your coaching areas, to already have the most difficult to set up elements in them, uh, every single coaching zone. And then the rest of your gym, you can have it modular. You can have it, you know, easily movable. Now you've optimized your entire gym for ease of coaching. So your coaches want to stick around and they're not throwing out their backs. 
Um, but now your kids are like, it doesn't matter which coaching zone they go into. So they're not disappointed if they go into the obviously lame one. Um, but they can learn your curriculum. They can go through your client journey and your space is optimized for that. Um, and that, that has huge benefits as far as like staff retention, um, how well taught your classes are perceived to be by the kids and the parents. Um, and frankly, it can save you a lot of money. If you think about this in the design phase, instead of just building my mistake, the Taj Mahal of parkour. And then at the end of the day, you realize that you kind of got to tear it down to like get a better design going. This is fascinating. So I have never heard someone talk about gyms this way. And it's different, man. It's different. Like I think, I think the gym mentality, when I see most gyms, it seems to me that they're like, oh, let's make really cool obstacles. And it's designed from like a tracer standpoint, like, oh, we need concrete. Okay, we need laches. We need a bar area. But it almost sounds like you're almost speaking in what I would almost deem some type of, I want to say fractal, although it's, it's not accurate. It's like you said something about having like laches available in each coaching zone. And so you're thinking long term. It, does does the does the design start from the curriculum or does it like what's the what's the essence then like what would be the foundation is the first foundation like what we're going to teach and then let's let's design it built on that teaching or is it more like a different way totally so the ground level foundation is what is your company's mission who the heck are you trying to teach um and we're talking about gyms right now. Like if we transitioned this to a clothing company or whatever other kind of parkour entrepreneurial mindset, it all of it has this ground floor for how you design the next step. Who are you trying to teach or who are you trying to serve and what's your mission? So at Freedom in Motion and like I would argue most parkour gyms, you're trying to teach people parkour who don't already know parkour yet. And more mm -hmm. often than not, that's going to be kids, you know, ages seven to 12, you know, like four to 13, whatever it is. Um, obviously parkour gyms love to get teens and adults in there, but if we just look at the industry and we look at, you know, who's paying the bills, um, it's parents with kids in that age. So if you know that you want to teach them parkour, but not just teach them, have them fall in love with parkour in the way that you did, I did, you know, all the, all of us OG parkour athletes get that like, that je ne sais quoi, that thing that really made you fall in love with parkour. You're trying to give them that and you know their age group. Now you have a basis for designing what your gym ought to look like. You know, is it for kids? Is it for beginners? Is it for high level athletes? Um, that's the basis of what to then design. Tell me about then um, your gym at Freedom in Motion seems to focus on kids and this is something that that is not intuitive from an outside perspective me not being a gym owner anymore when we did an interview for parker.com and you wrote an incredibly detailed answers for these interview questions i gave you you talked about freedom in motion focusing on kids like not a performance team it sounded like not high level athletes not it sounded like kids like elementary school middle school kids i want to know first like what is your demographic of your students and then secondly, why have you chosen to focus on that versus the demographic? Mm -hmm. The demographic for our student makeup right now is there's lots of four to six year olds, um, but our main criteria is seven to 13. Um, and then we do have teens and classes. We do have adult classes. So, you know, we have everyone in those categories, um, but it's mostly that seven to 12. And yeah, the reason why we landed on that um, at first was just sheer workability. You know, like when I started the parkour gym, when me and my friends started it, um, honestly, the idea was to make like a sick gym for us because we, we landed on that after we had all gotten kicked out and banned from our local gymnastics place. Um, <laughs> and then we tried to go to the city to ask them to build a, a parkour park. Um, but then that, you know, they said, no, what the heck is parkour? And then they encouraged us to open up our own gym. So we, we had that in mind. It's like, where can we do parkour? Um, but, you know, you, you've also then gifted yourself a $6,000 a month uh, rent. <laughs> it might have been 
more. Um, plus like all the other stuff, like I don't even think we were doing payroll for a while because we were all just friends hanging out. Um, and then once we started like really look at it, like what is working, what is not working? Our kid classes are mostly full. Those are some of our favorite students. These kids, you know, once we were three, four years into owning Freedom of Motion, the kids who started when they were 10 are now like trying to become coaches and they are now some of the most active people in the outdoor parkour community. Um, and, you know, the, the older audience that kind of came into this with us, they are now starting to only come into open gym every once in a while. I don't think a single one of our like adult community people are taking classes or having a membership paid on file at that time. Um, and they were slowly just, you know, it's life. They were trickling, trickling out, going and doing their job, moving away, whatever. So we really landed on kids because they're the ones having their parents pay the membership. They're the ones that are falling in love with parkour for the first time and uniquely like here in Freedom of Motion or, you know, at your parkour gym or whatever it is. Um, and then they stay with you throughout the long haul. Um, and as far as like changing lives and creating value in other people's lives, we were seeing that with our interaction with the kids. Um, and we gave adults a cool place for open gym, but it wasn't nearly the like transformation that we were able to create with those kids. Um, so those are the two kind of main pillars that had us land on that, had us really choose, you know, not just like secretly, but actually write this down and then tell all of our staff, like, hey, we are focusing on this avatar, like parents with kids, like we're trying to change their lives in this way. Um, and then the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the short answer is, is that it's a better demographic. It's a better business model. You're selling to kids versus selling to adults. I think it makes sense. Right. So here's a question then. Like, who would you actually take? This is you, Jimmy Davidson. Who in the parkour world would you actually pay to take a class from? Anyone in the world, or maybe like, there's like five people. Like, how many people would you actually pay to take a parkour class from? Uh, me, the athlete, who would I go pay? Yeah. You, you, Jimmy, you're like, man, I want to level up. I need to go to classes, but I'm not <laughs> going to go to that dude. Like, who are you going to, who are you going to pay? Like leveling up isn't my, my goal with parkour and it hasn't been my goal with parkour in a long time. So at this point, I would probably pay someone to give me like a two week tour around France, you know, like give me a parkour tour, two weeks around France, I'll pay you a couple thousand bucks. Like that's the person I'm paying at this point. Oh, that's hilarious. That's such a good idea. No, like, cause I've thought about this before too. So some of it was pride for sure, but you know, I reached a certain level that I was more or less happy with. And then I'd establish myself in the parkour world as being somebody with these brands I had started and being a coach. And I'm like, I don't like if I want to improve, who am I going to pay to teach me? And today it's like I would pay David Bell. Right. I'd pay Daniel Ilabaka. Um, like those are the only people that actually come to mind of like people whose style I respect, whose skill I respect enough that it's like. Yeah, like I will do whatever you tell me. I'll show up and you can be like, do push ups, I'll do push ups. Like, do backflips, do backflips, do like whatever you tell me, I will do it. But this whole point is the reason I'm making this point is because kids don't have that. Like, if you ask a seven year old, who you who would you learn parkour from? The answer is like, I, I don't know, like I'll learn, I'll learn from like my friend's brother who doesn't even teach and does it and can do some jumps. Like, there's no, there's no pickiness, you know, and there probably shouldn't be. I mean, at some level, it should be, obviously. But uh, you've clearly hit on what, now that you say it, is, is obvious. Although, to me, it wasn't obvious even before this conversation. But, like, that kid group is the demographic for parkour gyms, if you want to be profitable. And then you say that you have this open gym membership model for people that are more experienced, like you or something, that want to just come in and train. Yeah. And, and that's not the only model, you know, if you look at the CrossFit industry, um, you know, they started off mostly group classes, but if you really look at which CrossFit gyms are profitable, you know, uh, it's the ones that offer a lot of personal one-on-one -on -one training or semi-private group training. So if you were a parkour space, you maybe could do that, you know, offering like one-on-ones to really motivated teens or adults, um, so I'm not saying that there's not a model, um, but this is the one that we found and we've tested it like well past just like sustainable profitability. So um, it's it's my recommendation. For sure. I mean, it makes sense. Look, there's always going to be people who want to learn like 
you know, personal trainers, right? And so there's going to be someone who's 25 or 28 or 30 and wants to get better. And I spoke with Joey Adrian last week for the podcast. It's like, look, Joey's going to have a future if he wants it of high level coaching of an athlete is 29, 30 competing in the red blood emotion coming up and he wants some, and he wants coaching like someone like Joey is going to be able to provide that one-on-one, -on -one. but is there a plethora you know, there are dozens or maybe hundreds of 26 year olds that are willing to pay 200 bucks a month to go to a parkour gym? Mm, probably, but, uh, there's definitely kids. Yeah. You touched on it too. You said, and this is something that I said years ago too, was that the parents pay, right? So it's like as a parent, and tell me if I'm wrong, but as a parent, and you have you have a you have one child now? Yeah, and I have one kid, and then, then my, my partner's got two kids who are basically the same age. Okay, okay. So as a dad, and I'm not a father, but I realized this when I was teaching was that parents are always going to pay for their kids to do something, whether it's soccer or whether it's ballet or whether it's science club, they're going to pay for them to do something because kids need something to do. So like, even when the economy tanks, like there's, there's a budget to put your kids in extracurricular activities. So there's going to be money for that. There's going to be money for the eight year old that has crazy energy that needs an outlet. And the parents are going to say, yeah, we'll, we'll find something for you. So it seems like you've hit on something really great. Thanks. Tell, tell me this, Jimmy, what was the biggest shift to move you from having a gym to having a profitable gym? Was there, was it a lot of mini shifts or was there like, wow, this was the one like tweak that changed our trajectory? Um. Well, there are a lot of mini, mini shifts. Um, it all kind of started happening after I had my kind of mid twenties crisis, you know, where you go from like, you know, kind of dumb early 20 year old to like, oh man, I'm like, I'm messing up <laughs> to, to like, I'm going to do the best that I can, you know, like that shift that I think a lot of people have in their kind of mid twenties. Um, it was after that, that I started really thinking of like, um, I've, the gym has been open for six years or whatever at that point, but honestly, like, it's not that we've gotten experience and better every year. It's more that we've just lived the same year over and over six or times or whatever it was. Um, and there's been no measurable progress. So, you know, I, I had recently kind of agreed with myself to start taking like radical responsibility for things. Um, and just looking at the gym, and no real progress being made, you know, then you have to turn inward and say like, okay, what am I doing? Like, can I even define what a CEO even ought to be doing right now? Like, you know, what are the opportunities of growth that I'm providing my team members, which at that time was like virtually none, you know? So the big shift was learning that I needed to learn and my learning journey was not over, not just in business, but like personal development and, you know, all, all, all the things that you need to learn throughout your life. Um, I was aware of that, <laughs> you know? So finding a mentor for myself became pretty big. And at this point I've gone through six different mentors and have read like, you know, a number of scrolls of business books on, on my audible. Um, and then with each one of those interactions with the mentors, you know, you take it slow. They give you little chunks to chip away at things to work on. Sometimes like big pivots you got to make, um, like our, a big one was our, our price point at first. We just weren't charging enough. Um, and then committing to kids was a big one that we also had to do. Um, so those were kind of like the first big things that were getting out of the way. But then it was like, how am I training people underneath me to be leaders? Um, are we systematizing and documenting our systems, creating standard operating procedures for things? Like, do I have a playbook or like a, a you know employee manual um, to hand to a new coach or to hand to a salesperson so that they can do those day-to-day -day roles and that I can step back and go into more of like a mentor for my team slash like CEO, like looking forward position. Um, and, and you could seriously just pick any one of those things I just said. And it's like an entire conversation because this has been like a multi-year journey, you know, getting us from where we were to, to here we are with, with those mentors, with reading all those books. Um, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts myself and have my own like business heroes 
that I constantly have in my ear. Um, and just sort of optimizing your outlook of like, what else do I have to learn? What's the big thing I should focus on that actually creates value and doesn't just waste my time right now? And how can I empower those underneath me to like find their biggest strength and to become entrepreneurs in their own right? Um, it, it, it's a whole basket of stuff that has to occur for you to go from just person to entrepreneur to like a creator of something that's working. Yeah. Um, look, you've really impressed me, Jimmy, because I hang around business people all the time, I consider myself a business person. Um, and when you, when we first got on the call today, I was like, oh, Jimmy is not like uh, a shrub. You know, he's, he knows business at a deeper level. Like the way you were talking about like coaching zones, curriculum, designing gyms based on the curriculum. It was like, oh dude, this guy's like working multidimensionally, like multivariably, like over an iterative process to develop his business into a business. And I think that's probably actually one thing I failed at quite epically in many in multiple times in my life was, was not creating a business. Like what I've always said about myself is like, like I'm an artist who understands numbers. And so I created stuff out of my inspiration, but wasn't able to turn the corner you were able to turn the corner and i want to speak a little bit more. i want to ask you more questions into that because i think a lot of gym owners are trying to turn the corner and for various reasons me having some experience there myself are not able to turn the corner so i want to zero in on maybe those four things you brought up in that last little monologue which was fantastic i want to talk first about price point because ultimately what makes a business able to run is its sustainable profitability. And what allows a CEO to be a CEO is the profitability that allows people to be in their positions where they can do their jobs and you don't have to micromanage everybody or do everything. So an example, when I was running Revolution Parkour, before I sold the company, it was still a very small company and I pretty much did everything. I hired one person to help teach classes, but I would check people in at the front i would teach the classes i would do the marketing i would design the curriculum i was doing everything at the gym and it didn't allow me to step back and manage the business from a bigger perspective because i had to run the day-to-day -day. i had to be integrally involved in everything we were doing once you have the profitability where you can say hey here are my instructors they're teaching class then it seems to me that you can step back and then see it from a bigger picture that comes from profitability because you have to you have to have the money to pay somebody to do that. I might disagree with you here a little bit. Um, Fantastic! I love disagreements. Tell me why you disagree, and then uh, I do want to get to the price point thing because there's an important question there. Sure. Yeah. So there's some chicken in the egg here, or, or yeah, like what comes first? Um, like, do you have to be profitable to make the systems, or do you have to have the systems to become profitable? Um, and you know, your point was like, you have to have the cash on hand to be able to pay the people to do the things so that you can back up and run the business. And yeah, totally. But what happens when you're not profitable and you, you're listening to some podcast that tells you that you have to do this to become profitable, you know, what you do is um, like looking at your business, kind of the first big step is figure out what is the action that's creating the value, you know, and that's, I'm, I'm going to stick with parkour gyms here. That's teaching the classes and also getting members in the door and signing them up. Right. So you have, you have a fulfilling your service, you have a marketing, and you have a sales, like those kind of three big things. Um, the things that you're probably doing as an owner, um, you're probably doing a lot more than that. You know, you're probably posting on like every single social media channel possible. The thing you're posting is probably not targeted and mostly just artistic rather than like strategic. Um, you're probably personally in there sweeping the floor and like getting all the hair out of all the little cracks and like, you know, researching how much sand weighs so that you can hold down your block, right? <laughs> uh, that's a real world example of a past CEO who told me what they were doing with their day. <laughs> and so what you then do from that position is you, look at all of your tasks and you find the tasks or tasks that are the lowest value, the ones that really aren't moving the needle. It's just you treading water, kind of spending your time for the day. 
And that could be cleaning, honestly, that could be posting on all the different social medias. And if you can find someone to bring in and just like, you're, you're the person who's going to clean the floors, right? I'm going to pay you what, 15 something, whatever an hour um, to do that. But that's going to free up five hours a week for me, the CEO or whoever. And those five hours, you bet your butt that I'm going to be able to earn more or create more value um, from my new freed up time, then I'm paying that, that person sweeping the floor. So whether that's you dive into marketing and you fill in those spaces in the, in the gym that you don't have, and you do that through learning how to market, executing it, and then getting better. Um, or maybe, you know, let's just magically your gym is full, but you're not profitable. That gives you time to look at your accounting. That gives you time to scrutinize your price points um, and to like create those, those hierarchical structures that matter. And if you can free yourself of those tedious day-to-day -day things that actually don't move the needle and you can give those to team members, um, that's when you slowly lift yourself, you know, out of, of the water that you're under and you can focus on what matters. Um, but you can't do that until you systematize, delegate and focus on the, the things that actually do that. And oftentimes you need to start that process well before you're profitable. Okay. So we 100% agree on this, by the way, for, for sure, where, where, what's not clear to me is your perspective on, on how you make that shift. So imagine your gym is losing a thousand dollars a month, right? Mm -hmm. You're running that your cash flow runway is like being burned up because you, I don't know, like, I don't know, maybe you maxed out your credit to build the gym. You're now losing money per month. And now you're like, dang, uh, the last thing I want to do is hire someone and pay them 15 an hour to clean the gym. Because not because I don't want to, not because I don't think my time is better served other places, but because I don't literally have the positive cash flows to pay for this. Mm -hmm. So how that seems to be the, the catch-22 that a lot of business owners get stuck in. And I've been stuck in that myself. So as a gym owner, how do you, what advice do you give to someone who's in that pinch? Who's like, yeah, I want to make the jump, but I don't feel like I have the money to make the jump. Is it taking out a loan? Because now you're taking on more risk or more leverage. Or is it work harder or is it, you know, what is your answer? What is your advice for that? Yeah. Step one is get help, you know, find a mentor. Um, you know, if, if you want to reach out to me, I'll give you some advice or, or, you know, step one is figure out how you got yourself into this mess and get a little bit of assistance because clearly the way that you've been approaching it, you know, as the way that you've set it up, Adam, you're, you're in a total time crunch, you're in debt, you're paying off whatever, and you can't do it. So that's my step one. My step two is on you, you, you raise two giant obstacles. One is that you don't have the cash flow because you're in debt. And the other one is you have debt of time, right? You just don't have the free time. So if we look at the time side, if, if you're a gym owner, whose total day is just completely filled up, um, I, I guarantee that you're doing multiple hours of stuff per day that you could just totally stop doing right now and you would not notice a difference. So, you know, what, what those things are, you can find out by doing just like a one day, two day time analysis on yourself. And that could look like every 15 minutes, you just take out your notes on your phone and you type up what you're doing in that moment. And then a few days of that, you'll have just basically like a map of what you're focusing on every day. And especially if you do this with a mentor who doesn't have the like filter of perception that you do, they can see things a little differently. When they look at your time, they'll be like, you know, Jimmy, you're spending all this time, like moving stuff around in your gym to make it cool. Or like you're setting up for these competitions that you have coming up, you know, and it's taking you all this time, or you're, you're spending all this time on TikTok reels when like actually your engagement on TikTok is not justifying the time that you're spending on it. So let's cut, cut, cut. These are the things that you need to focus on and we're going to drill into those, right? So you free up your time by saying no, by saying no to stuff. Uh, there's a great book called Essentialism by Greg McCowan. And, and it's basically like say no to most things and get real clear and yes with the essential things that you have to do. So that's my solution. Number one is do a time analysis, get someone to help you cut out the crap that's not working. Number two um, if you're, in, <laughs> you set it up as you're in debt, you know, your cash flow is basically shot. Um, 
hopefully if you free up your time and you start doing more of the thing that's working, you'll increase your cash flow. Um, sort of by definition, if you focus on the thing that's creating value, it's sort of unreasonable to not see more value coming out of that. So I would like to say now you have some more cash flow, but let's say even if you didn't, you still are underwater, you're paying, you know, whatever your cash flow is just completely shot. Um, you know, now if you're looking at someone like Dave Ramsey, who has the debt uh, snowball, you know, you, you pay off the littlest, okay. easiest things first and you, you like let that accumulate and you, and you go. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is, you know, if you look at all the accounts that you have to pay off, um, like this one is $500 a month and that one's $500 a month. They both are that much to service that debt a month. But one is I only have $2,000 left to pay that off. And the other one is I have $100,000 left to pay that off. The one that's $2,000 and it's the same monthly debt service as the other, if you can pay those down first, you, you're basically purchasing back that cash flow for not as much money as like some of your other debt. So if you can figure out which cash flow is the best to purchase back for yourself first, you know, you could either save money to do that to free up your cash flow. You could get like a debt consolidation loan or a loan from a friend with more favorable terms. You know, there's, if you look at it like an accountant um, and you see like, where can I free up cash flow just based on the numbers? Um, now you can solve that problem in that way. So if you do both of these, you start thinking like a, like a CEO, you start thinking like a CFO and you get disciplined with your time, discipline with your focus and the discipline with your numbers. Like if, if, if I was someone's mentor, like I could get them out of that, you know, relatively soon. And, and I'm not like even trained to do most of that stuff. It's just like common sense. And it's not common sense actually. It's because I, it took me years to learn it. It's just logical, you know, but it, it can often be like pretty buried under the numbers or buried into the stuff that you think you're focusing on. So I get how it could be hard. For sure. I would say for me, the financial stuff was always intuitive, probably because of the family that I grew up in, like managing finances and look at interest rates and cash flow. Like that was all like, like easy stuff. What became the biggest challenge for me was the move the needle thing you talked about. Because I had a vision as an entrepreneur of like, I want the business to be this way, right? But the market actually didn't accept the business being that way. So an example was when I was running Take Flight, I was like, man, I want t-shirts to be $15. That's what I wanted because I kind of come from a mindset of I feel like $20 was too much for a t-shirt. So I'm like selling hundreds and hundreds and thousands of t-shirts at $15. And then realizing like, wait a second, like this doesn't support the business because now I got to work. 12 hours a day to make this work. If I just had the t-shirts at $20, right, then we would find out whether or not the market wants this product for a price that allows the company to function profitably and sustainably. Mm -hmm. So it's almost, I felt like it was like, man, I got to take a risk and be like, is the value I'm providing accepted by the market? And maybe it's not. And I realized that my desire to keep my company alive was stronger than my desire to to have a sustainable, profitable business because I was putting like, as I was focusing on things that wasn't making us profitable and, and uh, sacrificing my own time and my energy. So that's, that was not intuitive to me for a long time, which brings us to a point. I want to talk to you about price points. One of the biggest changes that people can make simply that can sometimes change the structure of their business is simply changing their prices. But a lot of people, a lot of business owners have anxiety about changing prices. It's like, well, if I make my classes this much more expensive, which makes the company work, people are going to leave. I'm not going to have money. The company is going to fold. What is your advice for somebody who feels like their gym either wants or needs to be charging more, but they don't want to make that move? Totally. So a lot of times people will price their their product based on or their service based on what other people are doing um this is like almost a joke at this point about you know uh, small business owners who are just opening up whether it be a gym or a restaurant they'll look around you know so if you're a gym they'll look around and go down the street and be like okay this gymnastics gym is charging 70 a month that martial arts gym is charging 75 a month so the way that I'm going to be successful is I'm going to undercut them both and charge 65 a month, you know, or I'm going to be like 
right at their price point and charge like $80 a month. Um, so that's how a lot of people get started. And that right away puts you in like a huge hole. Um, just to start with that, that there's, there's no value or benefit at all in being second place when it comes to who charges the least amount of money. Like if you are not the bottom floor pricing, you're just like five cents more. There's absolutely no advantage because if you're servicing an audience that is just shopping for the, for the bargain, they're, whoever's at the bottom wins every time. And the only way a gym will ever be able to be the low price player is by being such a giant massive box like 24 hour fitness or someone who like just based off their thousands and thousands of members, they, they make their like $10 price point work. Um, and like 24 hour fitness filed for bankruptcy recently. So like even that doesn't always work. So the other thing that you can do is uh, compete on price based on value. Um, so if you want to be like, like, again, if we go back to our mission, right? Freedom of Motion's mission, um, and, and as I say this, think about, listener, think about like your company's mission, what is it? Freedom of Motion's is to teach 1 million people parkour, but not just teach them parkour, it's they make them fall in love with parkour in a way that's personal and authentic. Um, and along the way, we're trying to provide a third place for people, third place being you know, like that, that home away from home where they can find community and, and find themselves. Um, so we're trying to create these for our, for our kids. Um, and then in addition to that, we know that parents are also just as much as our target audience. So we're trying to serve them also. So we're giving them like, hey, we are mentors for your kids. We have this entire list of life lessons that in class we're gonna create for your kid. For example, if they can't get over that parkour obstacle, we're going to create how this is like just like life a lot of times you're going to run into things you think you can't do at first but you practice you get over it and then in class once the kid does it everyone freaks out like you did it you know <laughs> this is just like life and the parent sees that and the parent is like holy moly this is way better than the gymnastics place down the street who just has some 16 year old barely teaching my kid how to do rolls on the floor you know so because now we're competing on value, value created for our kids, value created for our parents, and we're thinking about what is it that they need, what are the problems in their life that we're solving, now you go from feeling like you have to be a bottom price player, and now you can charge what you're worth and charge what you need to create that for your family, um, for your families at your, at your place. So for us, we know that we need uh, a lot of customer service. We know that we need someone calling parents and setting goals. We know that we need the coaches to care and to get lots of training so that they can back it up, you know, and that costs money. So, you know, we, we kind of figured out what those minimum price points are. We figured out how much extra profit we need so that we can keep opening gyms so that we can march towards our goal and like actually make an impact in the world. So that thinking should inspire and inform your pricing. Um, and, and if you're just basing it off of like external factors, like who down the street charges what, now you're in a race to the bottom, it's guided by nothing and, and you're sort of doomed. Um, so philosophically, that's what's behind that. Um, strategically, you can look at your fixed costs, like rent, for example, and you could, you know, if you have a $3,000 rent a year, or a month, <laughs> a year would be sweet. And you can Great you know that like a healthy gym would make, um, you know, their rent would only be 15% of the revenue. That's actually a really good gym. A healthy gym can be all the way up to 30%. You know, so based on my rent and I would have that only be 30% of revenue. Now I knew, I know I have to make X amount per month and I know I want to have X amount of members. So revenue divided by members equals your price. Like those are way more sophisticated ways of, creating uh, your price point than, than racing to the bottom. Uh, Jimmy, this is, this is quickly turning into a, a business masterclass from you. This is fantastic stuff, man. Tell me this, for somebody who's starting a brand new gym, how should they figure out what their price points are? Yeah, so it's kind of two things. One is figure out what you're offering. Um, are you a one to many, you know, like, a you have 10, 20 people in your class, 
Are you sort of on the medium side like we are, which is like six to 10? Or are you a small group, one to four, um, one coach to four students, or are you one-on-one? Um, so your prices really vary based on which strategy you're going for and how you intend on connecting to your audience. Um, and then based in that, like look at how many people you want to serve. You know, if you have like a 4,000 square foot facility to even a 1,000 square foot facility, um, uh, 150 people is like a pretty commonly recommended number to try to target um, just because that's Dunbar's number. Dunbar's number being the number at which a person can like meaningly, meaningfully sustain an amount of relationships, 150 people. So if you're expecting your staff to like really connect with those people, keep it at 150. Um, and then if you know what you're going to offer these 150 people, you know how big your space is, like then you can start kind of figuring out like as a business owner, I want my life to look like X, Y, Z. I, I either want to eat ramen noodles every day and I'm cool with that. Or I want to like be able to go out to lunch every once in a while and take my girlfriend, boyfriend out on a date. You know, like what do you need as an entrepreneur? Who are you servicing? How many people? What are your fixed costs? There's, there's like a, a few things to consider here. And again, this is where getting a mentor helps um, or at least like, reading up and asking some of the gym owners, like, like, how is your price point working for you? And you'll probably be able to <laughs> hear if, if they've made a mistake or if they are feeling good. Um, so yeah, w without like really specific things in front of me, it's hard to like tell any gym owner what they should do, but these are, these are all the things that they ought to consider. Yeah. Uh, here's a question for you. This came from my experience running a gym. I want to know first, how many owners there are of the gyms you have? And then secondly, how, if there are other owners and, or even if there's not, how have you found people that you trust and how have you created agreement either contractually or in other ways that allows you to trust the work that they're providing that they won't undermine from you or steal from you or something of this nature? Sure. Um, so at FIM, I'm 90% owner. Um, when I started off, it was me and my friend who opened the gym with me we were 50 50 um and it very quickly became like a a one-sided show like i'm i'm doing 95 percent of the stuff and and he was not so you know that that was painful at the beginning um and then it was just me um and then as i was running it for a while there were certain people in the company that um they were just like consistently always there for us like if we needed someone to you know, show up at the gym in the middle of the night because there's an alarm. Like it was the same people just like so stoked about who we are, like our, our personal interpersonal relationships because we're all like there for each other. Um, so now um, there's four different people who have equity in the gym. Three of them each have 3%. Um, and two of those people are, are like still in it, like trying to create value, get the gym to the next level. Um, and the plan is to like have them feel rewarded for that moving forward by them, like being able to get more equity, get on salary, like, you know, the, ideally the, the future is like bright and wide open for them. Um, and then as far as the other people in the company, um, the managers or, you know, the leaders or even the shareholders, um, your question was like accountability and how do you make sure that they're, you know, there's kind of two pieces that are doing the thing that they said that they would do and also growing as individuals. Are they staying in the same spot or are they growing with the business, which is sort of essential if you have a growing business. Um, so the two things we do there are on the like check-in side, we have monthly key performance indicator meetings, KPI meetings, where I check in with say our um, you know member success person and she's responsible for just two numbers at the gym. It's how many people cancel and how many friend referrals we have made because she can like really control those two things by keeping the members happy and keeping them engaged. So when I meet with her, those are the only two things that she reports to me about. And then we go in deep about those, like how can we make these things better? What have you tried? What's going on? Um, so all the managers have KPI meetings. And then once every quarter, uh, so every three months, we do a evaluation um, with pretty much everybody. All the managers do this with their coaches or their sales team. And then me and the you know, higher order shareholders do it with our uh, middle layer managers. And in evaluations, we sit down 
there's a whole form that goes through like all aspects of not only their job, but how they feel about their job and like how they feel about their career and their trajectory. Um, you know, and at the end, they sort of end up with a score because in each category, it's like out of five, how are you doing here? And they end up with a score at the bottom. And if it's a high score, then like cool rewards and high fives. If it's a medium low score, then we start creating performance improvement plans. We start setting goals. We have more frequent check-ins. Um, so, and, and we also like set up systems of mentorship for those people so that they have a connection either with me or, or Nathan, my operations manager, or someone outside of the company. Um, so that everyone has like a way to grow and a way to sort of have a barometer on how they're doing. Tell me this, what is your, the, and if there's any questions I ask that you don't want to answer because they're confidential, because they relate to say like proprietary business strategy or something, you don't have to answer. But what the, the thought that occurred to me was, I want to know what's the target for the number of students you have per gym and then how many employees you have per gym. Yeah. So the target per gym is, I don't actually have a target for you because, so I mentioned Dunbar's number 150. Right. And what we do every 150 milestone that we get to, we, we plug in more people into the gym. So we get more support staff. We, you know, make mm -hmm. sure that we have enough coaches or people on site to do that. We have the people who can give the goal review calls. Um, so like, I think right now we are, I think <laughs> it's kind of hard because we, we work with charter schools too. And the charter schools are not like monthly reoccurring members. They they submit purchase orders into you and your system, at least our system doesn't like obviously flag them as members. So I kind of have to like guess at this number unless I go in and, and do all the addition. Um, if my member success lady was here, she would, she has the number like on oh, yeah. one day. Um, but it's, it's over, definitely over 300 per gym. Um, it's probably close to 400 per gym if you include the charter school kids. Um, what was your other part of the question there? Um, employees, so for 300 or 400 students, how many how many coaches do you have or how many management staff, how many total employees per facility? Yeah. Total employees, we're at 40 about right now. Um, and for that's- a gym, For one gym? No, uh, both gyms. Over both gyms, okay. Yeah, and so that's, that's like a handful of coaches at each gym. Um, two two to three salespeople at each gym um, we have five six customer service people uh who are like operate for each gym so they're all remote um you know we have a we have a sales manager district wide we have a head coach district wide but then each location has their own head coach general manager um mm -hmm. you know so so there's like a lot of support plugged into this uh, and it's by means not just coaches and salespeople. For sure. And like a coach isn't a salaried coach. They're paid probably hourly. It depends. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're hourly. Um, in this year, actually, we're going to launch, launch, uh, salaries and, and describe like how to get them to people. Um, but most of our coaches are like right at that part-time full-time line of 20 hours a week. We're in California, by the way, for any listener who, you know, cause the, the full-time definition kind of changes um sure. per state so yeah most of the coaches are there and we have kind of three different tiers of coaches we have coaches that are just cover coaches coaches that are part-time and then full-time coaches that are that are in like all the time and those those people get different reward uh, compensation structures sure you know when we did that interview a few months ago from parker.com one of the things you wrote about that i was really inspired by was how one of the goals of your gym is and you're going to be able to expand on this more, which is what I want you to, because I don't remember all the details. But you wanted to build the gym in such a way that the people involved with the gym, the employees involved with the gym, were given, were paid well and given good benefits. Having 401ks, this sort of thing. You're, it's, it's, a, it's a shift. And the shift is community parkour gym to establish business. And there's even maybe another shift, uh, shift, which is like to corporation. Because as soon as someone says 401k, my mind goes, oh, that's corporate structure, you know. Um, can you expand on this? Because this is the dream, I think. I think like this is the dream. It's a sustainable parkour gym, profitable, 
that's providing for the people involved with the gym, that provides for the students, that spreads parkour, that spreads the message of parkour, the philosophy, the discipline, all these different characteristics that you build in your students. And this is like the highest order that I see of it is when you can provide structures that give long-term financial stability to the, the coaches or managers in the gym. So can you expand on that or tell me about that theories, approaches, anything you want to go off on for that? Yeah. So we do offer 401k plan for anybody who is 18 or older. Um, we do offer healthcare for anyone who is at 20 hours a week uh, or more and is 18 or older. Um, and then on top of that, we, we pay above industry standard. Um, you know, we, have, we distribute tips whenever we get tips, you know, so the people get paid, uh, well, you know, compared to, um, you know, if, if they went to the gym down the street, they would absolutely be taking a pay cut. Um, and we do that because like, yeah, we got to support our people. That's, that's a, we're a triple bottom line business, um, in our own people and how they are treated and the way that they are rewarded is absolutely one of our bottom lines. Um, you know, the other one being profitability and the third being, um, are we a good corporation for the planet? Uh, we have like a whole eco initiative. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that that's essential for a business to offer their employees. Like if they can, if they can get to profitability and sustainability, um, a huge, if, if let's just say if I was a robot and I had no emotions at all. And I, and I didn't care about anyone working for me. Still, you want to consider these people because if, if all of them protested and left, business is done. You know, if, if my best coach is starving in a gutter somewhere, like, you know, <laughs> that sucks. Um, so even just from like a self-preservation standpoint, if I want my best people to stay and grow and feel inspired to like give their best self to, to the people in the gym, like they need to feel rewarded. They need to feel like whoever's in charge cares, you know, um, totally. and they need to see that your values are, are actually like landing in their pocket, being, giving them the healthcare, giving them the 401k. Um, and, and, and with that said, like not all of our coaches um, are, are making like enough to live just on FIM with their own house in California, you know, like even with all those things, it, it can still be hard. Um, sure. So like, my mission to reward them fairly is still not over. That's why I said we're, we're going to launch uh, salaries this year. Um, and we have like a whole pay raise roadmap, like how a coach can get from our starting salary all the way up to like very good salary or, or pay per hour. Um, so like as we grow and as we get more profitable, like how can we make those layers on the pay raise roadmap like more achievable um, so that more people in the company are feeling uh, not just like they work at FIM, not even just that they like working at FIM, but that FIM is like a, is a heck yeah, like this is where I am, you know? Totally. I mean, talk about minimizing employee turnover rate, right? And you see these, you see some of these statistics when you compare, for example, Costco. Do you have Costco in California? Yeah. Okay. Like when you compare Costco and Walmart, and I've seen some, some statistics that look at Walmart has such a high turnover uh, compared to Costco and Costco says something like, look, the way we treat our employees, giving them health benefits minimizes the turnover rate and actually pays for itself when you compare it to Walmart's turnover rate. So yeah. of course there's different business models, but it seems like if you can make your employees like stable, excited about what you're doing and empowered to become better, then you, you have this amazing system that's, that's going to not only support them, but propagate your business model. Absolutely. It's not like you're achieving that. I have I have two questions before I actually want to totally pivot the conversation to some other stuff. You you keep bringing up these ideas that I want to ask you about. Um, speaking of salary, you are ninety percent on owner of FIM, right? So how do you think about what your value is in terms of how much you want to get paid or how much you want to earn or, you know, like from an owner standpoint, if you're like, okay, well we're gonna roll out salaries or let's say I'm going to give my employees a raise, then that's, you could say maybe less profit for the company, maybe, or less profit for you or something like that. How do you, how do you balance that? You know, the desire to be successful yourself, your financial goals, the financial goals of the gym and the employees. 
Totally. So we follow an accounting system called Profit First at the gym, um, which is a book in case ever, anyone is wondering what the heck that is. It's by Mike Michalowicz, who is a, one of my favorite uh, small business entrepreneur authors, by the way. Um, so in Profit First, you're, the, you're, the way that it changes your accounting is it has you change away from the typical accounting structure of revenue minus expenses equals profit you know, which could be $100 minus $100 equals zero. Uh, and it changes the equation around to be revenue minus profit equals expenses. Um, and that profit you get to set uh, as a percentage of what your revenue is. Um, so for us, we have our, our target profit percentage is 10%. So, right, so every, every dollar coming in from revenue, we take 10% of it, before we pay a single bill, 10%, we put it into a different bank account. And then with that leftover amount, that is our operational uh, revenue. Like this is our operational account. Uh, and we need to make the business work on that. And sometimes that means like, oh no, this month we're a little bit under. Um, do we take from the profit bucket and just fill it back in? No, what you need to do is you either like come up with like a creative new offer for the month or you cut expenses or you, you hustle, you do something to get your business into the vision that you're trying to create. Um, and so your question is like, if I pay other people more, does that mean less like sustainability for me personally? Um, and the answer is no, because we're, we're planning on always having profit being taken out and putting in that, in that bucket for the shareholders which means that the rest of the 90% of everything that can continue to grow. And in fact, that number grows a lot faster than the 10% profit number, just because 90%, 10%. So the pool available to pay everyone else grows way faster. And it just by definition is there for them and for the operations of the business. So like the business succeeding, everyone wins because I've already allocated like preemptively like where the money goes. Um, so it, it's a win-win how we have set up. Interesting. So you're holding your profit margin stable and then using all the other revenue to support and grow the gym. So the, the profit margin is more than 10% at the gym. Um, but we take 10% and we dedicate it to like, this, this is, this is the shareholder pot, you know? And then if we okay. have, let's okay. say for 3% okay. or 5%, in profit, but now we can take that and we've preemptively decided to uh, reinvest in the business, you know, put some of it to getting a 401k or healthcare, which is how that happened as we noticed we had enough to do it. Uh, and yeah. Wow. Uh, tell me about, I want to go back to something else we spoke about ownership. And I'm curious to know if you're willing to tell how the company transitioned from 50 50 ownership to being majority you and how that transition from being, I don't know what it was, but maybe a hundred percent you to now 90%. How did those discussions happen? And the 50, 50 sounds like the most interesting transition because of how much equity changed hands there. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. Um, so the 50, 50, which just in case anyone listening is thinking about <laughs> opening up a, or starting a business, with their friends, um, don't do 50, 50, just don't, it's not, it's not a good strategy. Um, technically we did 49, 51, which is, I had the 51, uh, which was like pretty vital to everything else that happens here. Um, but you know, it's essentially 50, 50. So what happened was, is like, we didn't have a plan of who was responsible for what it was just, Hey, you own half, I own half, let's start a gym. Um, there was no division of labor. Like, you know, he wasn't the marketing guy and I was the coach. Like it was like, everyone was completely directionless. Right. So <laughs> I'm listing a lot of mistakes that uh, hopefully the listener can avoid here. Um, and what happened was after two years of doing that, uh, I was just frustrated. You know, I had like multiple meetings with this person saying like, Hey man, like, I'm spending all this time doing X, Y, Z. And like, this isn't happening. Like you did, you did do this one thing really well, which is cool. Like, thank you. But all the rest of this stuff, you know, and uh, it wasn't until coaches started approaching me and it wasn't until 
outside people started asking me so much about it that I like was willing to overcome my want for it to work out. And then like, I, I had to, I had to step up and be a leader, not just for myself, but also everyone who was watching going like, you know, <laughs> how come this guy owns half, but I'm doing way more as a coach on the floor. Um, so the actual meeting there, we had a, we had an investor um, help us open our first gym. He helped to mediate a conversation and he gave his valuable perspective because he, he owns a martial arts chain. Um, and so we, you know, removed him from the business. Uh, we had in our operating agreement a way that we could remove someone who was uh, being negligent on their responsibilities. So it, it was like legally pursuable. Um, you know, you, you can't just like kick someone out for no reason. So the one thing that we did do was in our, in our bylaws and our operating agreement, uh, it did say how to like forcibly remove someone who wasn't contributing. Um, so that was cool, but there were tears, you know, there was a loss of friendship. Um, and like, I regret that it happened, but I don't regret that we took action after it had already been happening. Um, and then I was hundred percent owner for a while. Um, and then with those other individuals, so like one is this guy named Nathan Rogers. Now there's this guy named Nick Blake. Um, you know, there's two others who have since left the company, but still like definitely friends and did a lot before they, before they amicably left. Um, but so Nick and Nathan now, because of all the like work that they had done, uh, a lot of it for free, cause in the beginning, like no one got paid really. Um, but then they, they just kept consistently like being there and helping and trying to, trying to get to the next level with us. Um, and like Nick Blake, for example, like built three gyms, you know, like <laughs> himself leading it. Um, cause I don't think I've mentioned this yet. I actually live 400 miles away from my gyms. So I, I, there's a lot of stuff that I can't do. Um, so to award those people, we wanted to like give them equity and as they continue to do that, give them more equity so that. You know, when the gym grows and gets to, you know, it, it's over a, over a couple million dollar business now, but if it in the future is like a 10 or a hundred million dollar business, which I plan on making it, even just a 1% shareholder, you know, owner equity is like $50,000 payout, you know, so totally. um, yeah, sorry, or more than that even. So. so you gifted it, you gifted it, you saw their ambition, you saw their initiative and you said, we want to. Like reward and incentivize them to continue this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the investor that came in, were you able to buy him out? We did. Yeah. So he owned 15, 10% something um, for a while. Um, and then we, I think it was actually during 2020 or just after 2020 started clearing up, we, we had enough money to buy him out and we did. Wow. Wow. Um, look, you just said something that shocked me. You said you, you live 400 miles from the gyms. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is mind blowing to me. And, and to add to this, there's maybe some backstory that maybe you could fill in because you told me previously in the parker.com interview that you had moved to Seattle when the gym was first opening or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so how in the heck do you not live near your gyms and is this a new occurrence or is this something that's been this way for a long time it this has been the case since year two so uh 2016 2015 yeah oh my gosh <laughs> since 2015 you have not lived in the city where your gyms are located yeah or, or the state wow. i mean now i'm back in california but i'm <laughs> so but you were in washington for a while was my, my partner at the time, um, we were having a baby. So, uh, I moved away from Temecula, Southern California and to Seattle. Um, she was finishing her PhD at university of Washington. So finished all that up, had a kid, um, and I'm attempting to run it remotely at this point in the story. We have like almost no systems, almost no one else elevated the leadership. And we were, we were for sure failing as a business at that point in life. Um, and then later we actually moved to Norway for six months because of her job took us to Norway for six months. And then after that, we came back to California, but in Oakland, which is 400 miles North of Temecula. Um, 
and and I'm, I still live here. And the reason why I'm up here is because we we co-parent. So um, we're not together anymore, but we obviously have a, a daughter who's seven now. Um, and so they live in Sacramento. I'm over here in, in Oakland and, you know, we, we do the whole co-parenting swap back and forth thing. Um, and then when I can, I go down and I visit my gyms. Um, and at first, Adam, like that sucked <laughs> business wise. It was cool to be there for the kid. Like her name is Kaya, my daughter. And I genuinely love hanging out with her. Like I just had a whole day with her yesterday and took her on a Ferris wheel for her first time. Um, but business-wise it was almost murder but it actually ended up being like a really important step um taking me out of the gym and forcing me to learn marketing to learn customer service to learn automation to learn delegation like all of these things that i was forced to grapple with um and at this point like you know fast forward to 2023 if I wanted to take like a four month vacation, um, you know, I, I could definitely four hour work week it with the business. Like it's, it's very self-sustainable and, and needs like almost no of my input um, to, to maintain where it is now. If we wanted to grow and do new in, initiatives, like I for sure, that's what I focus on. But um, the, the gym as it is now, like the managers and the standard operating procedures uh, and the automations and systems we have, like, for sure, keep it running. And I only even thought to do all that because I physically couldn't be there myself. This is wild, Jimmy. You know, the What do they say? Necessity is the mother of all invention. You, yeah. you like pioneered and built a business, a sustainable, successful seven-figure business uh, that's a gym, no less. And you built it more or less, it sounds like, remotely. I've never heard a story like this, and maybe I don't hear a lot of stories, but I, I'm quite confident this is a, a a story on the unique side of business stories. Yeah, thanks. It's really commendable. Holy moly, dude. <laughs> I'm blown away. I really am blown away. Um, especially because I know gyms that are struggling, and I know gyms that are haven't, haven't you know, their owners are there all the time. I know gyms who the owners like multi-million dollar business. They they move, they travel. I know other gyms where the owners there every day teaching classes. I know other gyms where the owner lives in town and visits a couple times a week. So there's all different scales, and you've uh, you've carved out something pretty amazing for yourself, which does a little crazy in the world. Thanks. Um, how many gyms do you want to have? Do you, you said your goal is to teach a hundred? Uh, sorry, a million people parkour is that a million different people or will you consider a success when you said well every class that has 20 students adds 20 more to the pile yeah it's it's even more difficult to obtain than that um it's one million people but not just teach them parkour to get them to fall in love and have a life transforming experience via learning parkour and, and having it in their tool belt um and so if we measure that by you know everyone who gets to our level three curriculum like for sure at that point got that parkour has an impact on their life. You know, then we have a ratio of if we see a hundred kids, like 30, you get to level three. Um, so if that's the ratio and a gym can teach this many kids a year, we need, you know, it's like it's, it's a huge number, but like that's intentional because um, for sure, I, I'm just, I'm confident, you know, like this is what I'm doing. Like I like it. I, I think it's genuinely fun to like learn these things and like figure out accounting and do this stuff. It's genuinely fun to see coaches elevate into general managers. It's genuinely fun to like see our sales team have like big wins um, because that means that we just funneled in a bunch of kids and families into our system that we know is going to change their life in an immensely positive way. And that's the actual win for me anyway. So um, having, you know, 10, 20 gyms, like seems fun. It seems useful to, you know, the sure. community. Um, and it's like one of my, one of my tenets personally, uh, Adam, have you ever heard of the book, the four agreements? Yes, I've heard of it. Um, I think I scanned it. Like I, like I flipped through it a few months ago or something like that. All right. Um, no, 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 just like two weeks ago, <laughs> two weeks ago. Yeah. I don't remember what they are. But uh, they seem to be like good agreements. Tell us, tell tell me in the world what it is. Sure. So it's just these, it's a book about untangling the 
accidental agreements that society has sort of imposed upon you. Um, and, and that's specific to the person, you know, like maybe I need this many followers or maybe I need to like be the best parkour athlete. Like these things that you have unwittingly painted onto yourself, it's how to undo those and then give yourself four healthier agreements. Um, I always remember like two out of the three or three out of the four, but um, one of them is do your best. Like always in every situation is do your best. There are other ones like don't take things personally, don't make assumptions. Um, and it really dives in on like, what does that mean in like a really powerful life? But the one that like really just, you know, spanked me was always do your best. Um, and so every day, every week, you know, this isn't to say that I don't have rest days or chill out days, but you know, whenever I'm feeling motivated or whenever I'm starting a new initiative, I try to find like, where is the workable minimum, but then what is me doing my best? And I, I really intentionally get from like, am I just kind of half doing this? Am I like barely making this work to like, am I going to like slam dunk this project? Because that's how I want to live my life. Even if I sort of do a bad job anyway, as long as it's still my best and I tried and I'm growing, then cool. The reason why I say that is because you're asking how many gyms do I want to do? Well, the answer of that is what kind of impact do I actually want to have in the world? And what's behind that is like, what would me trying my best result in? You know, if I'm trying my best every day to have this specific like positive impact in the world, what does that actually look like? Um, and that's, that's like a whole bunch of gyms. That's, that's a franchise, you know, structure coming up soon. Maybe, um, you know, that's, it, it's a lot more than just a chain of parkour gyms, honestly. So uh, I, I think the future of freedom of motion and the future of those who are in it right now, especially those who are in leadership positions um, has like a, quite quite the journey ahead of it <laughs> extending beyond just like 100 200 gyms i think just yesterday we were calculating that if we got to 2000 gyms we'd be a billion dollar company um and that doesn't sound that hard you know chick-fil-a is well past that and you know like they open 200 restaurants a year you know and uh, I, I i don't see why we couldn't do that too no um well you might go public and then i'll buy some stock in you so Cool. That would be great. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a firm believer that we don't know. We, I'm a firm believer in this idea that there are no limits, not because there literally are no limits, but because whatever limits you think there are, it's probably way below what the real limit is. And you see this in athletes and some of like the greatest poor athletes in the world that are pushing things that we thought wasn't was impossible 10 years ago. And they keep getting better and better and better and better. And it's pretty mind blowing. And so I think about that too, and not just a physical level or an intellectual level, but in a success level or an impact level. And so one thing, the thing, probably the thing that inspired me most about the interview we did previously was when you said a million students, because I was like, oh snap. I was like, Jimmy's thinking really big. He's not like, I want to have a parkour gym. He's like, no, 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 no. Like, I want to change the world through parkour. Because a million people is no, you know, no walk in the park. Anybody who can impact a million people is powerful. And in today's world, though, impacting a million people is like, well, maybe you go viral or maybe you have a great YouTube channel. But working with kids in your gym on a weekly basis for years at a time and doing that for millions of kids is a is a world-changing endeavor if it's accomplished so i realized oh jimmy's on a different level like your paradigm is bigger than most people's paradigm and it sounds like you are uh, that's both like informing and supporting the business you're building in a really powerful way do you agree with that or am i am i misspeaking i mean i'll, I'll take that <laughs> thank you that's very nice of you. all right <laughs> um what about what about other? Uh, so there's this there's this question I wanted to ask, but I can also kind of change the question. But the question was, hear me out. Why do you focus only on parkour? Because a lot of parkour gyms are not doing just parkour. They're doing like aerial silks and break dancing or CrossFit and parkour. One of the things they offer. Let me expand a little bit. At parkour.com, we now have a, a list of all the parkour gyms in the, in, in the world. 
and we're missing a lot of them. But whenever we find new gyms, we add it. And one of the questions I came about when creating this list was, if there's a parkour gym that offers, if there's a, sorry, if there's a gymnastics gym that offers parkour classes, do we put them on the list? And my answer was no, because it's not a parkour gym. You're, you're offering classes. Now, if someone knows, like, their company is that we offer parkour classes and we teach classes outside, I think I put, I think I found one of those and I put them on the list because I was like, they're a, a parkour focused company. They just don't have a facility yet. So I'm not going to dock them for that. But if parkour is just this thing that you kind of do, I was like, I'm not interested in that. Like, I'm interested in the people that are, we do parkour. Now, that being said, if you're apex movement or something like that, and parkour is your focus, but then you also have breakdancing or something, it's like, that's fine too. You can be on the site. But what stood out to me is when you said, we do parkour. That's what we do. We don't offer other things. We don't want to offer other things. We're focusing on our core competency, which is teaching parkour. How did you arrive at that conclusion? And how do you see yourself compared? And I know you don't compare yourself in some ways to other gyms that aren't doing that. Yeah. Um, so I, I forget the quote specifically, but I'll, I'll try to botch it real quick. There, there's one of like, you know, would you rather dig a million holes that are in, that are a foot deep or would you rather dig one hole that's a million feet deep? You know, like which one, which one's a sicker hole, <laughs> you know, what, what, which hole fills in more stuff. Um, and so for parkour, for us, like we, frankly, in the past, we did have a different company come in and do aerial silks. We did do tricking. We did do like a class that was like, this is tumbling the class. Um, so we, we have in the past, but again, this is in the era where we didn't even know our target audience. We hadn't like come up with like a really thought out curriculum yet um, because we were, we we're taking a step forward in like multiple different directions, you know, like all these different directions, one step, instead of just consolidating it all into one direction and having all of our steps forward be in that one direction. And now we're like a mile ahead on the trail, you know, as, whereas before we only took one step ahead on, on a thousand different trails. Um, so Anyway, that, that's the metaphor that I, that I botched, but it makes sense to me. And so when you bring it back to like how it shows up in reality, um, like parkour is frankly hard to teach really well. It's easy to teach like in a shallow sense, like, hey, kid, jump over this box. That's, that's easy, you know, but there's a reason why the barrier to entry to a successful parkour gym is very high. There's a reason why if there's just some like money tycoon watching this podcast who wants to open up next door to me and rip us off, there's a reason why I'm actually not afraid of that at all, because it's really difficult to create a parkour curriculum that doesn't just teach parkour, but gets people like the life lesson of it, gets people the, the like connection, the community of it. And it gives to parents like all of those things to keep the kid interested so that they don't quit in like three months, which is the biggest boon or a bane of a parent when they put their kid in soccer and then they quit, let's try basketball. And then they quit, you know, there's reasons why kids quit. Um, and it's not just because they're kids, you know? Uh, so creating that environment and creating that for the, for the audience, but also creating that for your club, for your coaches and for your whole team so that everyone is like focused on the same thing, moving forward and pouring in their own creative thought and their value day after day, that is hard. And if I tried to do that for like tricking a sport that I know almost nothing about, or like aerial silks, a sport that I know almost nothing about, like I could hire people to do that, but they would just be doing that one class that one day, you know, or I could build a bunch of trampolines and like have a trampoline class and the kids would think that's sick, but like I can monetarily, I can fill up the space with parkour classes anyway. So there's not an opportunity lost but also like I don't personally care about trampoline like trampolines are fun but like I'm not trying to change a million people's lives through the power of trampoline like it, it's just not me and I think it's someone else's mission someone else's that's mission. totally cool <laughs> <laughs> it's totally cool if you want to change someone's life through the art of like underwater hip-hop like go for it but it's go just not it, what man. I do 
and I and I know parkour. I know how it changed my life. I know how it changed a lot of people's lives around me. And that's what I'm trying to inspire in other people. And I can't do that if I'm distracted. So how much, this is a question that might not be fair, but uh, answer it anyway, if you can. Um, what percentage of that decision then is a business decision? And what percentage of it is more of a spiritual decision? Um, so and I, have a, I have a theory for you, by the way, like I, I'm going to answer the question, what I think your answer is, but I want to hear your sure. thoughts on it. For sure. So I'm tempted to say that it's not a spiritual decision. Um, now, if you if you sit down with me and, and ask me about like spirituality and even how it reflects on what I'm up to with FIM, it's absolutely present. And like, I really could talk about that. But like focusing on parkour, it's really just like, does, well, first of all, does can parkour change a life? Does it have the potential? And like, yes, because personal experience, that's all the evidence I need. Next step. You know, like, do I have the skills to, tr to transform anyone else's life through any other physical discipline? Like maybe basketball and wrestling, because I know those a little bit, but like, not really. And like, definitely not tricking or, or some of those other sports or like, um, you know, so I just, I just can't fulfill my value creation through those other sports. Um, and like I said earlier in this podcast, you're not going to be a bottom price player. You want to compete on value and just parkour. I can create a lot of value for a family. I can create, I can change a kid's life, you know, but with parkour, like I'm not so confident if all of a sudden you give me a skateboard and I have to do it with a skateboard. I'm, we're probably just going to like go climb some walls anyway. Um, so just from like a value creation business perspective, uh, I think I have more to say on it from that angle. Um, Clearly parkour, like spiritually, you know, there's a lot of connections, just like if there, if I was a yoga person, I could absolutely go on a spiritual yoga tangent. Even if I was a skateboard person, I could go on like a skateboard spirit tangent. Um, and I totally can about parkour, but I think it's more of a business thing in this sense. Hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to disagree with you about yourself, which, which is not my place. <laughs> Welcome to Hot Takes and Adam Dunlap, which is what I do. So um, spiritually, and this is, I say this and you can say I'm wrong. You get the final say, but it, it's said in, in, the, in a way to, to compliment you and to augment what you're doing. When I think of spiritual and the way I use that word was in the sense of reflecting who you are as an individual and what you want to do with your life. And then the business is more like, what is the best financial play? And it seems to me, business conversation, that the decision is 100% business and 100% spiritual. Because, and again, you get to disagree and give the final say, but it seems to me like, based on your skill set, it is the best business play. And based on business principles and focusing, it's the best business play. But it also seems like if you had the ability to do this with basketball, you wouldn't do it to be like, I like parkour more because it changed my life. Or if you had the ability to do this with silks, you'd be like, I just don't care about silks that much, you know, or wrestling or whatever it may be. So it seems to me like you found alignment with like your mission and your purpose and who you are. And it also is the best business play at the same time. So to me, I don't see those from my perspective, viewing you in this conversation, I don't see those as separable, which I think how, if I were to, to speak to somebody about you, I'd be like, that's why Jimmy's so powerful because he's found alignment in what makes sense in the world of business and what makes sense for his spirit and his being and his passions and interests in life. So it seems to me like they're one and the same for you. But um, like I said, you get the final word on, on, uh, on that, so. Yeah, I think with your framing, uh, that's accurate. You know, it's like, a what what has brought me fulfillment in my life uh what has taught me how to overcome anything or scrutinize a difficult situation and find a path forward um you know parkour is is one tool in the entire toolkit that my life has been exposed to um but it, it's certainly been a catalyst of, of many things so I do think that that could be a catalyst for people in the gym um running the program and running it has been a catalyst for a lot of our managers 
um, in the terms of like personal growth and your own personal journey of getting from like young, dumb 20 year old who, you know, just wants to go hard and be sick all the way to like, what does my life mean? What am I trying to do? And like, what matters, you know? So I, I think a lot of those are at play. You seem to have an, an adept business mind, right? You've read a lot of books. You've worked with mentors. You've developed a successful business. How much of your potential as a businessman have you achieved? If 100% is the Super Saiyan, Jimmy Davidson, how close are you to 100%? Uh, I think I'm at 30%. <laughs> yeah. Where do you think you have to improve? Um, well, the biggest thing is I don't know what I don't know. And mm. if, if I had been asked this question just a few years ago, I would have been like, oh, 80%. I'm kicking ass, you know? But like the, the journey is discovering new horizons and like getting over the, the little hill that you're climbing up now that you can see the horizon of. But then when you're standing on the hill, you can see the range and you're like, oh, snap, okay. there's, there's a lot more to do here. Um, like I want to I want to get to the end of my life having an empty potential tank, you know, like, um, and I'm, I'm taking this from, uh, from Alex Ramosi, who, who said this just the other day on his podcast. Um, but I've thought it before too. Like I want to get to the end of my life with the potential that I have or that I perceive and have it be completely like gassed out. And then, you know, I'm, I'm crippled, you know, decaying into dust <laughs> at the end of my life. But that translates into, there's tangible value out in the world. Like other people have been impacted, like things were created, um, paradigms were shifted. And then internally, like I feel complete, which I, which I do now for sure. But like after a whole lifetime, hundred years plus with the way healthcare is going, um, like not only will I hopefully feel like really stoked about the life that I was given, but also I can look out into you know, what's behind me and, and really get whether or not my potential was actually used or not. And hopefully it's hundred percent. So I'm 30 years old right now. I just turned 30 like two weeks ago. So that's why I say 30% because I got, I got a lot more to go. 1% a year. I think so. Yeah. Cause every time, every new year, you might get to a new <laughs> like hilltop, see some more mountain range and you're like, well, crap. <laughs> I got you some know, more to do. There's this Simpsons episode that comes to mind. My parents didn't let, let me watch Simpsons growing up. They said it was too, I don't know, crass or whatever it may be. But uh, there's this, I saw this episode one time where they show this mountain. I'm like, oh, it's a big mountain. And then they zoom out and there's a mountain next to it that looks even bigger. And it's like, oh, that's a big mountain. And then there's, they do it like three or four times. And then you realize that this mountain that you thought was so big was actually really small compared to this the real mountain and we see that also i think in like dragon ball z which has been an inspiration for a lot of early adopters of parkour of like you know they get to nine thousand, and then 10 seasons later they're at like three million or whatever it may be yeah and it just gets stronger and stronger and so yeah well we'll see what happens man i'm definitely rooting for you and all you do and i need to come visit the gyms no doubt about it and see what you're doing um let's maybe kind of uh transition to to maybe the end of the discussion because you've been really generous with your time and i want to hear a little bit about uh, a more personal side like a personal journey so my first question is what is the highlight of your parkour journey or career whether as an athlete or as a business owner is there a moment that if you said if i could relive that moment or that period of time what is that yeah. Um, man, I, I've had a great time with parkour. Uh, so <laughs> to, to give a little walkthrough without getting too in depth. Um, and I kind of need to do this to find my answer to your question of the highlight. Um, you know, we started parkour at our high school as a school club and we got, we got that club to be the biggest club on campus, 150 kids doing parkour back in you know, 2011, 20, 2010 is when that was. So there was just like so much community around me and just so many people just like learning parkour and nobody knew what they were doing. And <laughs> I love that. Um, shortly after I was able to start traveling, um, I was on American Parkour's tribe back when the tribe was their team. 
Um, and with them, like that was my first ever plane ride was I hopped on a plane and went to Chicago and like, that was my first ever parkour gig, got paid a good amount of money for that time. Um, met some of my heroes, you know, like I was back when Levi Muning, Muningberg was like still training. He was there, like got to do some jumps with him, like back when Frosty was still on tribe. Um, and like, those are the people whose videos I, were, I was watching and, and like, totally. that was my weekend motivation, you know? So once I started feeling like, um, like the, the movement I was doing was, you know, I, I never felt like I was even close to the best, honestly. Like I, I think when I was on the tribe, especially when I first got there, I, the story in my head was like, oh man, I, I might be the worst on the team, but damn, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> this is cool. Um, which, which wasn't like just dis, dis depowering in my head. It was, it was more like gratitude building. Um, but then like, you know, those kinds of jobs took me to Washington DC and New York and Kentucky. And then later with freedom in motion, um, we got a job that took us to Las Vegas and then Italy. Um, we went, went to Moscow for <laughs> a little bit, like, um, and then obviously lived in Norway for six months and like did a lot of parkour with them. So it's really like absolutely opened up my perception of the world and of collaboration. Um, and I think it's really great that I was never like the best at kind of any aspect of parkour. Like I was never the best at, at flipping or jumps or anything, but I was always like just okay enough to like kind of have my head in the conversation, <laughs> you know? So I, get to, I got to meet the people that I like really looked up to. And then when I turned around, there were like people that knew me and, and wanted to like, you know, do some parkour with me or, or just chit chat, which feels cool and like super validating. Um, so that was like a really fun time. Um, lots of traveling and I still do a fair amount of traveling um, with parkour, uh, you know, and then fast forward to, I think now I feel like I'm in sort of the next like highlight of my parkour career. Um, I, as far as my movement goes, I'm, I'm really just like a skills and flow athlete. Like I, I'm pretty competitive in speed, but like, I'm like a third placer at best <laughs> at speed comps. Um, but in, if I show up to a skill competition, um, you know, I'm, I'm usually a, a podium or, or at least having a pretty dang good time with like what's happening there. Um, for, for regionals, you know, if I went to like NIPC, I would, I could compete and I've qualified a few times, but, uh, like. I'm not winning, but it's still fun. And the reason why I say all that is because my movement right now, I don't, I don't have to focus on like being the best. I don't even care. Like I haven't for a long time. And I think that's pretty evident in like how I train and the content I put out. I'm like, I'm just like touching my hands on concrete and spinning and jumping and it's fun, you know, like that's my parkour now. So it's really just like the community and the traveling and, and the taking my friends to some place like the road trips, like, man. So I, I think I'm in like a new season of, I love parkour all over again for these reasons. Um, and it feels great. That's really cool. The tribe was, was one of the teams. You know, when I started in 2016 and 2017, I applied to be on the tribe and I applied to be on team Tempest and they both said no. And then I went and started my own stuff, but the tribe was, was the team. And those were really, from my memory, and correct me if, if you have a different memory, if I'm wrong, there was 12 or so members, I think, and those were seen as the top guys in the country. This might have been 2000, 2007 or so. So those were the guys. So Frosty, Levi, um, and some others were were like the American team. And then Tempest, but they were more stunting and things. I, you know, they didn't have the same parkour resonance at the time. It wasn't until they opened their gym that I think they really – kind of grew to this huge prominence that they have now. But the tribe yeah. was the game. I didn't know you were a part of that. I had no idea you were a part of that. Yeah. So I wasn't, I, two things here. I got to join the tribe when it was the best version of the tribe. So like Levi was still there. Dylan Baker had just joined. Vinnie Coriel had joined kind of the same time I did. Um, and there's obviously like tons more, like Frosty was still there. So I got to be there during my favorite era of the tribe, which was like just freaking cool. Um, but I think because of that, like 
I wasn't, I wasn't like the star of the show at any moment. And, and if you didn't live in California, like you probably didn't really know me actually. So it's all good. Um, and then the tribe sort of didn't stick around for that much longer, you know, like mm-hmm. a couple key players left. Um, at some point I mm-hmm. left, uh, I focused on film, like Dylan Baker, Vinny left. Um, and like a year or two, maybe like three or four years later, the tribe was just like dissolved. Um, just, just for whatever reason. Um, and since then APK has successfully pivoted to like focusing on schools and stuff like that, which is super cool for them. Um, but yeah, so it was just like a turbulent and high news story time. Uh, and I was just kind of along for the ride. For sure. And you worked with us to take flight for a little bit. Right. Um, I was offered. Continue. Go ahead. I was offered a sponsorship via Take Flight, but I received the sponsorship the same day that I received a sponsorship from APK. Um, And my deciding factor was I went to a parkour jam in San Francisco and I just met Mark Turok. He was there, you know, and and so I I just said yeah to that since I knew him. Um, But I don't I don't actually think I ever worked formally with um, Take Flight. I wonder if you submitted photos for some type of photo contest or something like oh, that. Oh, I did. Yeah, that was even before. That must have been it. Yeah. I have this I have this very clear memory of you, the shirts <laughs> you're wearing, the pants you're wearing, and there's like wings yeah. behind you or something like that. I'll have to look up. I have all these photos oh, on a drive. Man, that's so old. Yeah, back when Take Flight had the, the big parkour down the pants, you know? <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. I mean, oh. that speaks to that era, you know, because parkour became this fad, I think, for a time there. It was this new thing. No one knew what it was. It started taking over with the MTV Parkour Challenge. It was on TV. It was in commercials. There was this, there was this, I don't know, three or four or five year span where parkour kind of took center stage in various ways in the culture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you had the tribe doing performances and you had all this stuff going on. So yeah, dang, that was 2010, 2010, (laughs) 13 years ago. Good. What advice would you give yourself? So you're looking back 10 years ago, a 20 year old Jimmy Davidson. Mm -hmm. And if you can like speak in a time machine and send him a letter. Oh my God. (laughs) Well, that's, that's a right before a 20 year old me. I think that's before I even realized I have a kid on the way. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't think I'd freak myself out with a letter like that. (laughs) That would be really. (laughs) Um, you just let yourself let yourself figure it out. I think so. If I could go back in time, I just wouldn't go back in time right then um, because if that, there's like too many things that are about to happen. I think I would just like mentally explode. Um, mm. But if I could, if the gym was open already and I could go back in time and like just kind of give myself some nudges there, um, especially open up my my scope to finding a mentor and to reading more books at that time, I was like very closed, not closed minded, but just like closed resourcedly, you know, like nothing coming in, no input. Um, I would absolutely go and give myself a little bit of like personal development. I think that's, that's the thing I do. I go give myself some personal development, (laughs) like um, Mm -hmm. having a better relationship with like, doing my best, not taking things personally, um, being aware of my own filter and other people's filter. I think once I got past stuff like that, which everyone kind of has to grapple with in their young adulthood, that opened up the the gates to like then do all the other stuff. But I was sort of in my own way for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, life has a steep learning curve. Yeah, And a lot of us in our own way. And I think I was one of them as well. Um, I don't think many people don't look back and think that same thing at some point. Jimmy, is there anything else that that you want to bring attention to that you want to talk about projects, initiatives? Of course, I want to know, I want you to say how everybody can follow you online and follow the gyms online. Is there anything else that, I think we've had a fantastic discussion. And I think you've, you've brought some incredible value that I can't wait to clip and, and give like in succinct bites to people. I think people are going to eat it up because I think you've, 
you provided some some really great ideas, some great book references, some great wisdom that people, especially who want to start a parkour gym, can do. But also in life in general, in terms of focusing, in terms of potential, in terms of the humility that you've shown, and other things. Is there anything else, however, that you you want to talk about, stories you want to tell, advice you want to give, projects you want to bring attention to? Is there anything else? Um. Let's see, as far as like, you know, if, if there's a listener inspired by all this and they are an entrepreneur or, you know, aspiring to start something or improve what they already have, um, it's, it's just imperative to, you know, find experts, read some books, join some groups and realize that uh, your idea is probably a good idea, but absolutely not the complete thought. Um, and it really will behoove you to like seek help and collaborate and to work on that side of it as well. Um, you know, if anyone wants to kind of spy on me and what we're doing, like freedominmotion.com, um, go check it out, see, see what our website looks like, see what kind of stuff we post on our blog. Um, there are some great resources for kind of everybody on our blog. Um, but even from a, a entrepreneur standpoint, like you can just go spy on us and like see how we are like communicating with our audience. Um, if anyone wants to ask me any specific questions, um, they can email me at jimmy at freedominmotiongym.com. Um, you know, I, I've, I've given like little snippets of advice. If someone wants like a longer, like, you know, let's go in depth about my business. Like I'm happy to tell you what my, I, I tend to charge for that kind of thing. I'm happy to tell you what, what rates are, you know, so you reach out to me. Um, or you can follow me just for more lighter parkour stuff uh, on Instagram at Jimmy Davidson PK. Awesome. And so you, well, I think I'm muted. There we go. So you, you actually also provide consultation for people. I do. Um, it's not really something that I like advertise or put out there. Like you won't see me you know, talking about it on my, on any of my feeds kind of ever. Um, but when people reach out to me and it seems like I really have an answer to what their <laughs> current problem is, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll set up like a, a coaching call with them. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it's usually an hour. Uh, like I just had one just two days ago, um, with this young other parkour gym owner also in California. Um, and we, we kind of dived in deep, on he thought he needed to go hard on marketing, whereas we actually discovered that that would be a huge waste of money because his bottleneck in his business was somewhere totally different. And we like came mm -hmm. up with strategies and came up with next steps on how to um, release the linchpin elsewhere in his business so that if he even did marketing, it would have an effect anyway. So um, and we got really specific. Um, so yeah, I do stuff like that. And whenever people reach out and it's a good fit, I offer it. Are you interested in doing more of that type of thing? Um, yeah. So um, there's there's this one mentoring mentoring company who has asked me to join their team as, as specifically the parkour guy. Um, oh wow. Yeah, but that like I don't know <laughs> what's going to happen there yet. I don't know if I'm going to do it. Um, so it's probably not even appropriate to name drop or anything. Um, but like. So it's certainly something I've thought of, but then it's, it's back to like, am I going to start digging the second hole or walking in this, some other direction? Or should I focus on like FIM's already at like, you know, multi-million business and it's already like challenging to, to like stabilize and continue forward. Um, and do I have the time to take on other people? Yeah. And that's why I do, but if I advertised it, I couldn't service everyone. So I just, those who find me like, cool, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also value my own free time and I want to go out and do parkour and I want to go and like have those long walks in the woods where I just think about like what's next for me and, and everything else. Um, so it's a sort of a priorities conversation that I'm having with myself. So, um, but as far yeah. as like one or two clients, so a week, absolutely. Fascinating. Okay. I brought it up because I'm having a conversation probably next week or maybe next in the next couple of weeks with a guy named Justin Taylor. He's the founder of Firestorm Freerunner. Mm -hmm. Do you know Jim? Yeah. Yeah. He's doing and his parkour professor thing. Yeah. He's doing a parkour professor thing. And I think they want to start some type of mastermind 
demonization or something where people sign up and become a part of it. And I mean, obviously there's a, there's a, a market opportunity for that. It's going to be a question of who does it best and who has the, you know, whatever. What, there's all sorts of obviously all the business elements involved, but um, it sounds like you're doing your own version of that at a very low key while staying focused on what's working, which is this gym and the impact you're having through it, which no one can fault you for that. It sounds like a pretty, pretty good approach. Yep. Thanks. And Justin's like, a, you know, me and him are friends. He's not far from where I am. So, um, you know, sure. good luck to him if he, if he does that. Um, and he totally could. He's, he's been, he's had parkour professor.com for a little bit. Um, so if he's now pivoting to doing that, like, cool. Just doing a lot of stuff, you know, he's got the WCKC, which is where I had it. They had a regional event or something. I don't know what it's called exactly, but then an event here in, in, in Portland last week, and I went up there and talked to him. And so, uh, all sorts, he's a good mind, I, I think, but we'll talk about he and I, and we'll, we'll know more. But cool. And well, you know what, Jimmy, you are really generous with your time. I'm so excited to get this interview out there and to. You know, help spread your experience. You know, you're focused on a million students, but I'm sure you know that along the way you're going to impact other people that you're expecting to impact. And this is the type of interview that I think, where like, let's say you get to be 100 years old and you guys have only gotten 990,000 students to level three. Let's say something like that happens, right? Maybe we'll find out that well, actually. The wisdom you shared with other people allowed their gyms to create students and then they trained 500,000 students between all those gyms and so i'm incredibly grateful for your time and incredibly um, thrilled for your success and if there's anything that i can do with parker.com can do to support you and share what you're doing please let me know and we'll do it absolutely you actually found the reason why I would do a podcast like this or take time to do other stuff, it's, it's exactly for what you just said, because it's, it's in line with our mission of mm -hmm. giving that to other people. And like, I believe entrepreneurs are the catalyst for change, like globally on a, on a massive scale. So mm -hmm. if there are more entrepreneurs out there who know how to execute and are executing on something like worth their time, then, then absolutely that, that as an end goal makes, that, you know, the two hours spent here, like one of the best investments that I can do. So absolutely.